<laughs> Don't hit me again. <laughs> Wait for that noise to die down here. Well, it's wonderful of you all to come to share this event with me. For me, it is a very blessed occasion. 61 years ago today was when I met Master, and much has happened since then. You all are part of what has happened and I'm so grateful for it. And when I see the faces of these people in the choir, when I look at you all, and I see changes in your faces, because of course, you have aged, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I have to say that the changes are pleasing changes. It's nice to see more and more love and more and more joy in your faces. I think that the greatest satisfaction of my life is that. Thank you all. When I came across the country to meet Master, I came with two desires. One was to find God, and that was my first desire. But my second desire was also very important to me. I felt that this is such a wonderful thing that I found in Master that I want the whole world to know about it. And uh, my life has been dedicated to helping the whole world to know about it and to doing what I could in that direction. I have always known that the desire was uh, unrealistic. It didn't matter to me. Whether I succeeded or not didn't matter to me. What I, what I felt was essential was that I do my little bit. And uh, I think that the extent to which I've been able to succeed in anything is the uh, degree to which I have not felt I was doing anything. I found that m when I let Master and God work through me, I can accomplish things that I could never have done on my own. As you know, I wanted to be a writer before I met him. I wanted to be a playwright and a poet and different things. and. Uh, what I really wanted in those things was not to become famous as in anything, but to share truth with people. And the more I progressed in my efforts to find truth, the more I realized I was just hopelessly outside it. I didn't know what was true. So I decided, because I was sincere, and I decided, why should I inflict my ignorance on other people? I will just shut up. And I gave up wanting to be a writer, and I gave up wanting to do anything for anybody until I knew that I could do something for them. But when I met Master, I realized that this is something very important. Now, that was not an easy thing, although it's true that I was completely changed when I read Autobiography of a Yogi. At the same time, I must say that my past incarnations have been full of... Uh, heavy doubts about God, about truth, about everything. And I think probably that has been a great advantage to me because in doubting, I have been able to find the answers because I have no doubts now. But in doubting, I have found the answers to people's doubts. And I doubt that anybody could have or has had <laughs> a doubt that I haven't anticipated. <laughs> And I have to say that when I read Autobiography of a Yogi, it was a, ab I just was absolutely convinced by him. But finding somebody materializing on page eight in a wheat field before Master's father, it was just a little <laughs> beyond me. There were many things I had to put on a shelf and just say, well, I can't face that now. 
And I think we have to do that with some of our doubts. Because if we want to know what jo joy is, if we want to know who we are, then we have to assume that we don't know yet, and we have to assume that there's something to be known, and therefore we should have the humility not to say that's nonsense, which was the first thought that would come to mind. I mean, raised in a Western home, raised on a Western education, um, I had actually told my mother when she talked about the miracles of saints and so on, I said, Mother, stop that. It's just nonsense. I wouldn't accept it. It seemed ridiculous that Jesus walked on water. I didn't believe it for a moment. I didn't believe anything that I couldn't see with my own eyes. But I had to say that, first of all, I had reached the point where I just didn't know truth, and I desperately wanted to know truth. And I wanted help, and I didn't know where I would get that help. Nobody that I had met had given me any inkling that he knew more than I did. And so I wasn't willing to listen to anybody. And you may call it arrogance, and it may have been arrogance, but at least when I found what I felt was the truth, then I completely followed it. And in coming to Master, there were times when I had doubts. There was a time when, because these samskars are deep-seated in the mind, and if he had said that it's raining in Los Angeles, I'm afraid I would have, my instinctive feeling would have been a bit the sun shining. I couldn't, I hated myself for that thought. I couldn't help it. It was a part of my, my uh, samskars that I had brought over from many lives. But I did know one thing. I believed in him, even if I didn't know that he was telling the truth even. But I knew that there was something in this man that was for me and that I would follow him no matter what. And any time one of the disciples told me some far out story, my first question was, is it something Master said? If they said no, then I felt free to doubt it. If they said yes, then... <laughs> if they said yes, he said it, then I wouldn't doubt it. But uh, really, it, what I discovered, and I would like to share this with all of you, because everybody has doubts. Anybody who's intelligent would have doubts. How could you not have them? But I found that the cure, the best cure for my doubts, was love. I knew he loved me when I first met him. He said, I give you my unconditional love. And he asked the same pledge from me, and I gave it. And uh, I understood by the love there that everything else fell into place. The mind can have a thousand doubts satisfied and another thousand will leap into the breach, ready to be, ready to challenge you. But when you understand from the heart, and that's how I understood his book from the first, I understood him from my heart. My mind couldn't accept many things that he said. I mean, after all, I'd never heard of Indian philosophy. I had never heard of the truths of yoga. I'd never heard of the need for a guru. I'd never heard of uh, yoga or dharma or karma. Or I knew nothing about reincarnation. I didn't know anything except what I had studied, what I had thought, what I had re reached by my own reasoning. But suddenly I was socked with so much uh, information. It was just completely beyond me. And yet I knew in my heart that he was mine. And even that period, which was not a long period, but it was a period, Master said at that time, that Satan was testing the organization. And as happened with Jesus Christ, that toward the end of his life, he said things that really tested the mettle of his disciples. He said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, you just think of that. Um, if you think that he carefully explained what he meant, then why did the Bible go on and say that many people stopped walking with him after that? No, he was willing to challenge them. But those who understood him on an intuitive level, they came through that. And so I came through that period of doubts. But uh, my real faith was not shaken because my love was not shaken. And I remember one time I was sitting in front of Master and... Uh, he was editing. I had helped him with the editing of the Gita. He was going over these changes and making suggestions and thoughts on his own on the manuscript. And I was just sitting there thinking, what a wonderful thing 
it is to be your disciple. And when he, he asked me to help him, when he stopped working, he asked me to help him to his feet. And I remember he, I, he took my hands like this and looked very closely and loving me into my, lovingly into my eyes. And he said, just a bulge of the ocean. He was just a little expression of the ocean of God. He was nothing. He just saw himself as one with God and as an instrument of God. And any work that I have done in this life, I don't really think that I'm capable of doing anything. I, that's, I think that's the reason and the secret to how I've done so much. Because I haven't done it. He has done it through me. But I have found again and again, for example, in writing a song, I haven't stopped to think the way normally a composer would. Well, I don't want this note to go up, down, sideways, whatever it might be. I haven't stopped, stopped to think that way. I've just said, these are the points I want to this melody to express. Give it to me. And I've been open enough to let that melody come through. And sometimes it didn't make any sense, but when it was through, it made perfect sense. It's amazing how many times if you allow God to work through you, and this can be in cooking, this can be in dressmaking, this can be in writing, it can be in anything. But if we allow ourselves to be instruments of the divine, then God can do so many things for you. But remember, doubting is the greatest obstacle on the path because no matter what comes, like with my my that terrible period I went through when if he had said it's, ra it's raining in Los Angeles, my instinct would have been to say, I bet it's ra it's, the sun is shining. A terrible thought. But yet I couldn't help it. It was there. It was an instinct. But I had to understand that that's what it was, was just an instinct, a tendency from the past. And I held my mind open, and finally I found all those things clarified. And I can say now, after 61 years, and I could say it after one year, this is the best possible path to be on because it is sent by God. Now, when I met Master and had this desire to share his these truths with other people, he saw that I was one who really wanted to understand. This is to question whether he said, when he said, is, is it, uh, he didn't, in fact, but I'm saying if he had said, that the sun that is raining in Los Angeles. He didn't do that. But I, I asked him more questions than anybody that I ever heard of. And most people wouldn't have dared ask them. But I did dare because I wanted to know. And he appreciated that in me. And he, um, even in a group of people, I noticed that he always had his eyes fixed on me in talking. And... I would be sort of embarrassed because I wanted to just meditate and close my eyes and feel his presence there and feel the blessing of his presence. And instead, um, he was always talking to me. But I realized in time it was my mission. And I had been brought to him for a reason. The No other disciple had that desire to know what he was all about and to understand what his teachings were all about. And uh, the... He said to me repeatedly, you have a great work to do. And he didn't say this in front of other people. He always said it privately. One time he looked at me and he said, every man, uh, except for St. Lynn, every man has disappointed me. And you mustn't disappoint me. And he spoke with so much power. And I vowed I would not, I would do my best to fulfill his wishes but of course he had good men disciples. It's not that he didn't have them. But they weren't... What, the difference between men and women is that men's energy is more outward and women's energy is more inward. And uh, these are biological differences and they just... It's not a difference of um, spiritual maturity or anything. It's just difference of interest. My zeal was to get out there and let everybody know about these truths. And... Uh, my, the women disciples who were over me just used to think, well, why can't you just wait and be told what to do? They got fed up with my wanting to constantly do this and that and the other thing. But uh, the men were there thinking of their own salvation. 
And I have to say that I've been willing to shelve my, di my salvation if I can help other people through. He wanted some, of, some people like that. I don't suppose he wanted everybody like that, but uh, he was grateful to me that I had that tendency, and I still have that tendency. I don't care about my salvation. I want to help other people. This may be the wrong attitude, I don't know, but he said it this way, and you mustn't disappoint me. And I think that I've done my best to not disappoint him. It hasn't always been easy. There have been many times when starting Ananda was not. I know um, one time somebody said to me many years ago about my music, she said, well, you can write happy music. You've never suffered. I said, it's because I have suffered that I have earned the right to write happy music. You don't find the things that I have found or that we find here at Ananda by sliding into them. It, they take work. They take hard work. And they do take suffering. And the spiritual path is one of martyrdom. We have to go through those difficulties in order to overcome what is in us. We all have come into this world with this burden of self-definitions and this karma to work out. And we've got to be willing to face anything. Myself, I have often wondered if I would die a martyr. I will be happy to die a martyr. I would like my death to be as useful as my life. And I hope that in that, that I would pay off m other people's karma too. I really don't care what happens to this body. I don't care what happens to me. If I can be of any help to other people, I will be grateful because this is all I am. I am here as a sacrifice for everybody. And it, that's the way I feel. And it may be a dumb way to look at things, but I can't help it. <laughs> this is the way I am. I just want to see this whole world understanding. Now, the trouble is that the world, of course, it doesn't listen to me. Of course, it won't listen to me. Well, of course, it won't listen to all of you go out and teach these things. It won't listen. This world is bound to, and the world is on, on the brink of great, great suffering right now. We're coming into a period of great depression. You keep reading in the papers about there's hope for uh, everything getting better and maybe things are going up now and so on. It's going to crash. It's going to be much worse than it is now. Money, Master said, will not be worth the paper it is printed on. And I think Obama, who is a nice man, I like him, but I think he's going to be the destruction of this country by being too nice, by wanting too much to help. There's a limit to how much he can do. The more he prints trillions of dollars to help other people, the less the dollar is worth. You know, there are two types of taxation. One is what the government can take from you, and the other is what they uh, do by printing more money. They can't take more money from you than they dare, but... Uh, they can always make the dollar less and less worthwhile by printing more to pay off our debts and so on. Right now we are over a quadrillion dollars in debt in derivatives. That is no joke. The, the dollar is sustained by the faith of people. The dollar is not worth that faith. It is going to go down the tube. And every country in the world will suffer from this. But America perhaps primarily, because if you fall from a th third story you're likely to kill yourself. If you fall from this table, you may get a bruised knee. And so places like India, where they have, they too will go through this, but it won't mean as much to them because they are used to suffering in poverty to a certain extent. Americans are not used to it. And when they found they don't have money, I was telling a, a nephew of mine the other day that, uh, that to bring my food into the inner city is not going to be easy when nobody has food. They'll be hijacking those trucks on the way into the inner city. And he said in Detroit, he saw on the news just a week or two ago, there was a truck coming into the inner city with groceries, and they had two men riding gun on the side, on each side to protect that truck. This is no joke. It's going to get much, much worse. And I say that the most important thing that you can do 
is to buy land in the country and get a few friends. And I know that I'd love to see all of you come join uh, Ananda, and that would be a wonderful thing. But not everybody's going to join Ananda, but everybody ought to think in these terms. If you can grow your own food, if you can live simply, you won't suffer. But if you think that you know, so many friends of mine are desperately in debt owing to having used their credit cards as if it was money. A credit card is not money. And some of these credit cards, they charge you 44%. I, one time years ago, I was using my credit card to buy equipment for our, our uh, um, recording studio. And I was thinking, well, we... We need this equipment. My mind was on our need for it. But I found at the end of the year that I had spent $2,000 just paying interest on those loans. I decided from then on I will never put anything on my credit card that I cannot pay off immediately so I don't have to pay any interest. And I have stuck by that. But really, don't use your credit cards. You're, fi- you're going to find yourself in great sorrow. Now, what happens when there is such indebtedness? What happens when there is such a depression? Some countries invade other countries, thinking that they will somehow um, get what they want for themselves, at least. World war is a very strong likelihood. America is protected by two big oceans, but it is not protected from high-flying missiles. No corner of this world will be safe. There are Sri Kartikayan in India who used to have the position equ- equivalent of um, Ed J. Edgar Hoover in this country. And in a country far more populous than this country, it was an important position. But I give his position only to help you to know that he knows what he's talking about. He has, he has told me more than once that there are 30,000 known nuclear weapons in the world, not to speak of the unknown ones. You can't have that many nuclear weapons and not expect them to use sometime. And if somebody uses them, somebody else will use them. No, we are not living in anything but we're living on a powder keg, except that a powder keg is nothing compared to a nuclear weapon. We're in very serious trouble today, and I don't think that the next years you're sitting here comfortably And it doesn't seem possible. But I'm telling you, it's going to happen. I was watching a movie last night on, it's called uh, um, Crude Awakening. Not Rude Awakening, but Crude Awakening. (laughs) And it's pointing out that the oil supplies in this world are getting less and less. And although the government is saying we have just as much this year as last year, how could you if you've used so much? And every year they keep saying we have just the amount. These are lies. You can't expect the governments to tell you the truth because it would be too inconvenient to tell you the truth. But the truth is that we are losing our oil supplies. Many fields in Texas and elsewhere are empty. Their machinery is there, but there's nothing to drag up anymore. And you know where most of the oil is? In the most dangerous part of the world where there are all these terrorists. This is no joke. We are going to find that oil is simply not available. Everything in our society today depends on oil. I think that the answer is going to have to be not to create some massive thing that will help the whole country. I think we've got to, this is what I'm trying to do with our uh, solar energy and I have Darna working on it. I really would love to see some people here donate money to support Darna so he can finish his research because the solar research that we're doing there to get electricity from solar power, we don't want some big thing that can help the whole grid. I'm thinking of little villages. I'm thinking of small communities. I'm not thinking of flying over the bridge. I'm thinking of flying under the bridge. I think the answer to our day, our problems today, is small communities, not saving the whole country. I think that Master's statement when he said that that, uh, this idea of world brotherhood colonies is going to sweep the earth like wildfire, 
I'm here to say that I believe this with all my heart. I had this idea when I was first, first when I was 15 years old, and I have always had it. And when I found that Master had that same idea, I decided to give my life to fulfilling this idea. And with God's grace, I have fulfilled it. And you all are the proof of it. But I don't think that Ananda and Master's teachings and everything will be, it, will, it won't be only that kind of community. But any group of people who can learn to live small, live simply, create enough energy to feed their own needs. You may not get it from the county, from the government, but you can create your own. Have a small thing rather than a huge thing. In India, I've said, uh, let's help villages to. The beautiful thing about India is that they don't have the huge infrastructure that we have in this country. Anything that we do now, it's just almost impossible. But if we can help individual villages in India to come up, if they can have the power just to supply their own electric needs, just to supply enough energy to be, create a, a uh, refrigeration system so they can have fresh food, if they can have enough um, electricity to study at night and learn computers and run them and so on, they don't need much. I would like to have the world learn to live simply, as Master said. Learn to live more simply. Learn to live within your means. We have been borrowing from future generations, and we can't go on that way. Will we go back to the medieval times? Will we go back to horse and buggies and so on? No, I don't think so. We're in Dwapara Yuga. It's an age of energy. Things are going to be very different. But at the same time, we must understand that as the truth of it is that God's consciousness is center everywhere, circumference nowhere. And so the changes that mankind needs to go through will also have to be at centers, not at huge things, not looking for the periphery of a country and trying to expand that periphery by invading other countries and so on. We've got to bring it down to a small level. If small groups of people can buy land in the country, live together, I, we have various ways we can help people to live harmoniously. Um, these are, this is another subject. It is not easy to start communities. I had, you know, you find the community now so peaceful and so loving and so full of happiness and willingness to help other people and so on. But I have to say it was not like that in the beginning. There were people who were ready to jump down my throat any time I opened my mouth to make a suggestion. They didn't want me telling them what to do. How do you lead people like that? It's easy to drive them if you've got a gun and a whip. <laughs> but I didn't want to drive them. I wanted to lead them. And that meant that I had to let them be and understand as they would. One of my techniques of leadership is a very worthwhile technique. I just didn't bother about those negative people. I paid no attention to them. I put all my energy in people like Jyotish and Devi and others who wanted to do what I was trying to accomplish. And the other could, others could spout and rage and do anything they liked to, but it just didn't work. We finally got a group together. And there was one time when over here at uh, the farm area, they decided that they wanted to have a whole different community separate from me. One of their bylaws was that I would have no say in any decision that they made. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I called the ringleaders of this thing together, and I said, if you did this, I would give you six months to be driven out of here, three months to be served your first notice of bankruptcy, three more months to have that concluded, and then you'd be out of here. All the money you're getting here to pay for this mortgage is coming from where we are at the retreat. You're not paying it. I said, I will not listen to your stupid suggestion. And there have been times when I had to be very firm. But finally, I called the community together, and I said, listen, I'm so tired of this one horsepower energy. I said, either I don't often speak for what I think is needed here. I don't try to intrude, but there, after all, I'm the founder of this place. And I, I, if I say something, I want you to heed it. And if you choose not to, then I will leave and never look back. I'm just not interested. 
Well, I'm not stupid. I didn't make that challenge to them until I knew that I had a majority. <laughs> but this majority was fed up with that one horsepower energy. And uh, we lost about 50 people, wasn't it, on that occasion? Blessed thing, it didn't matter to us at all. Getting rid of a few weeds makes it possible for the garden to grow. But uh, it's not easy. You have to have patience, you have to have respect, you have to serve people and not be a leader. And you cannot afford to be a spineless person. I had to be strong sometimes. I remember saying to one person who, he was at the very first year of our existence, passing the word around that in Japan they have this system that when the old guard get old, they retire in favor of the younger ones, <laughs> and they should take over. And I went to him one day and I said, listen, I did not create this community to turn it over to you. <laughs> and he left, but that's fine by me. <laughs> I had to be strong, but I knew what I was doing. And I, I had to do it by leading, not by driving. And it worked. But by working with those who did want to do God's will, who did want to serve Master and bring his mission into fulfillment, not just to fulfill their own desires. This was essential. And I think that any of you who want to start communities, keep that thought in mind. Because the usual tendency is that when see people, a few people get out of line, you go to them and try to bring them in line and try to help them. And you waste all your energy pouring money down, an em down a bottomless pit. It won't work. Work with those who do want it. Work with those who are positive. And the negative ones will take care of themselves. Some will come in, in with you. Others will leave. Let them make that decision. You can't make it for them. So don't try to force people. Know that people are like this. And work with them accordingly. Now, I, I believe this is going to be the answer to this oil crisis. That we will not be able to have sufficient solar energy to, ch to bring wealth to this country, but we will have enough to be able to bring wealth to a little little community. And I believe that we can do, this is what uh, a community in Damanur in Italy is doing, and I'm trying to get our people to think this way too, that uh, during the Depression years in America in the 1930s, there was one small town that survived beautifully. What they did was print their own currency. And I'd like us to think that way. And especially if we can work with other communities so that each one can specialize in something that others can gain from. I think this is important. No one community. Gandhi said that it takes about a thousand people to make a village viable. For instance, for one person to make enough money as a barber to be as a barber, and so on. But uh, we don't have a thousand people here. We have two or three hundred. We need to understand that with the help of other communities, one community can be a farming community for uh, a group of people living in the cities. Now, how are they going to get into the cities if they're people trying to stop those trucks? Well, granted, that is a problem. But if they can grow their own food on little plots in their own gardens and so on, they too can survive. With our methods, and we're learning methods all the time of permaculture and so on, that will enable a small plot of ground to pre produce a great deal of food. Learn these things. These are the things that are going to be useful. The great electric grid cannot be changed overnight. I think there will be a huge depression, as I have said. But I think that individuals can thrive. And I think it's going to push people in that right direction. Because when you have a few people that you are living with, and can share your ideals with them. You know, the typical village is a place of gossip and small-mindedness. But if you have a group of people come together because they believe in the same truths, they come together for ideals, then you have a worthwhile thing. And I would like all of you, going back to your own homes, wherever they may be, keep these thoughts strongly in mind. It would be very nice to start a community of Ananda people, but not everybody will do that, but this ideal can be everywhere. Small communities 
growing their own food. What do you care about money if you can have enough food to eat, enough clothing to wear? It's all you really need. Need a roof over your head, yes. But you can live on very little. You know, I have lived on $10 a month. This seems impossible. And it certainly probably is impossible now. But back then it seemed impossible too, and I was able to do it. And I looked for simple things. I made chapatis instead of buying bread. I bought powdered milk instead of regular milk. I had one dessert and to take a little sweetness every day. I had made one dessert last a whole week. I made uh, tortillas with corn flour. And uh, I found that oatmeal you can buy in bulk, and it's much, much cheaper. And I found many things that made it possible for me to live on that small amount. And you may think, well, even so, you did have a house over your a roof over your head, and you did have electricity. All right, I did have those things. But nonetheless, it was quite a job to make it, and I have to admit I lost a certain amount of weight. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I did it, and I did it for three months. And uh, I had to stop doing it because the people in whose, on whose land I was living went to India, and they couldn't stay there any longer. But this is true, that you can live on much less than you make. We are spoiled in America. We have everything we want. I have a beautiful video screen that's this big that I don't need, but people gave it to me. I'm glad to have it. I love to watch videos sometimes, but I'm happy not to do it. And people give me things that I don't need, and sometimes I accept them for their sake because it's good to give, but really I look around for somebody else to share it with um, very often. You know, you don't need that much. I, I know my father, I was born into a well-to-do home, okay. But my father in Romania, two of his uh, neighbor's sons went to America and they went bad because of all the money that their father gave them. And my father decided he would never give us money. He gave us 50 cents allowance a week. That may seem very little and it wasn't much. I'll tell you, if I wanted to take a girl on a date to White Plains, we had to walk five miles. <laughs> Not the best way to make a good impression. <laughs> but uh, when, I, when I went to college, he gave me $3 a month. Well, that's not much money. But somehow I was able to treat my friends to milkshakes, and uh, I had what I needed. This is a good training. Don't give your children too much. When I wanted to take voice lessons, I remember my teacher saying, saying to me, your lessons will be $5 each. It's not that I need the money, but you need to pay it. And I appreciated that. By paying that amount of money, I took those lessons seriously. We need to not take money for granted. We have been doing that too long. Everybody here is dressed differently. Everybody is here is dressed nicely. And uh, certainly I appreciate it. It's very nice to see. But it won't be so in a year, perhaps, or two years. But worse than that is the warfare. Think of India and the position India is in now. Pakistan on one border, China on another border. Both of them not very friendly to India. Do you think India is going to get off scot-free? I do not. I do not for a moment. I don't think for a moment. I'm, I know when I went to Cambodia in 1958, I felt a black cloud over that country. And you remember what happened to Cambodia. They went through great suffering. Well, I went over, I went to Germany. The last time I went to Germany, I felt a cloud over that country. Not as bad as Cambodia, but yes, I did feel a cloud there. And I felt it, I think, because of the karma that they have to pay off. They've been an aggressor for several, many, many decades. And they have to pay off that karma. Master said Europe would be devastated. India, Italy, I hope, will be less devastated because of the karma of all those saints there. But Europe is going to go through a very hard time. And Master said Russia will be annihilated. These are not soft words. These are very strong words, and they're words to take very seriously. 
He said that this world is going to go through a great trouble. You know, just thinking of it in abstraction and not thinking of individuals, no, not him, not her, just think, wouldn't the world be a lot better off if there were fewer than one billion people? Right now there are six billion and more, and growing exponentially. <clears throat> I do think that this planet is sort of like a living being that has fleas and is trying to shake them off. I, I think the best attitude to have is being willing to accept it, because death itself is not painful. When you leave your body, it doesn't matter to you. And if you can leave it thinking about God, what better death can there be? We are children of His, and if we've reached that point of understanding that we know Him, Krishna says, those who worship the lower gods, they go to their gods. Those who worship the ancestors go to their ancestors. Those who worship me go to me. I've been reading a number of books by people who have been able to communicate with the dead. And most of these dead people go to the world of ancestors. They go where their families are. And they see their uncles and aunts and mothers and grandfathers and they feel so happy. But then they come back to this world. When Krishna says, even at the last moment, as you take your last breath, if your last thought is of God, you will go to him. Don't worry where you are now, but have that thought of God constantly in your mind. This path is something so wonderful. There is so much joy that comes with thinking of God. There is so much bliss that sometimes it's hard to take. And if you understand that that is the goal of life and that all that we are seeking in this world, it doesn't... You know, the wonderful thing about this world, I said to... There was a yoga magazine in Los Angeles that they asked me for the quote that I found the most inspiring in the Bhagavad Gita. And I said, well, the whole thing is an inspiration to me. But at the moment, the thought that comes to mind is Krishna's statement to Arjuna. Oh, Arjuna, um, get away from my ocean of suffering and misery. And this person answered, what do you mean by that? Well, people don't see suffering when they're not suffering. She said, how do you answer other people when they ask you, when you ask you what that thing means? Well, the thing is that when you're happy, everything, it looks as if nothing can ever change. But it has to change, and it does change. And you don't see people behind their closed doors, and you don't see the bickering and the dissatisfaction. There's a lot of unhappiness in this world that you don't see, and even the happiness is such a compromise with reality. If you can go thinking of God, death itself means nothing. It's only the painful thought of leaving things behind. A very good, very good practice is to just feel every night that you're giving every attachment to God. Somebody said to me the other day, well, I used to just give my home back to God by tossing it into the fire. Then my home caught fire and burned to the ground. <laughs> I said, okay, but that isn't what I said. I said, give up your attachments. Don't burn the house to the ground. Burn your attachments to the ground. <laughs> Anything you have a th strong thought about can certainly materialize. But uh, don't have attachments to anything. You'll have to leave it sooner or later anyway. It's a good thought to hold in mind that anything that you're afraid of, you will attract to yourself. And so give up fear by facing it and accepting the possibility that it should come to you and then say, could I accept it? Of course you could accept it. Sooner or later you'll have to. <laughs> so bring your mind to that point where you can accept mentally whatever happens to you. Death, fine. Disease, okay, let it be. Whatever man suffers, he suffers. But if you're not touched by this body, if you don't think of this body as your own, then if you don't say, oh, no, no, not that, you'll find that his strength to survive will be there always. And I have seen, because I've had to go through lots of pain, and the worst pain in my life was being thrown out of my guru's organization 
not by him, but by his followers. And I, I had said to Dr. Lewis many years earlier, I had said that I'm trying to develop a strong attachment to this place so that I will never even be tempted to leave it. And here I was thrown out of it. It was a great, great suffering for me because I had thought that that was the, the only way I could find God. But they weren't my guru. He was my guru. After they threw me out, I was able to do the things he wanted me to do and had told me to do things that they didn't want me to do and were trying to stop me from doing. And so actually, this thing which seemed a great tragedy to me was the greatest blessing that ever came to me. Are these planes that's doing the same thing as before? I hope not. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, here we always, the worst thing we think about when planes fly is the possibility of fire. But this was another thing. It was a drug bust recently, and so I'm curious about that. Anyway, what is the worst thing that could happen to you? Go to prison? Okay. But some people have had to endure even that. Some people have had to endure great things. But the worst thing in this world, if you accept it, will turn out to be your best. You know the story of Tori Ken, Ten Boom? Ten Boom, was that it? Beautiful story, but her sister was a saintly woman. And they were both arrested and taken to a German concentration camp. <laughs> and this, this uh, girl was very, very, had a wonderful attitude. She said to her sister, we should accept everything with, God's, uh, with gratitude to God. And this St. Cory said, but should we even be grateful for the fleas in our barrack? And she said, yes, even to them. And it wasn't many days later when a camp guard was taking people around, some officials, and they came to the door of that particular barracks, and uh, the guard said, let's not go in here, it's too covered with fleas. And they had been having a religious gathering. If they'd been found, they'd have all been shot. But this woman was, was uh, finally she died of the disease, but she died in grace. You can die in grace in the most terrible situations, if you think of God, and he will sustain you and he will give you his grace. Miramata, one of Master's close disciples, was with him and a group of others at some public performance, and I don't know which one it was because I wasn't there. But Mira told me later that Master said, I noticed that you were looking at this girl in the row in front of you, a girl about three years old. And she said, you, and she said, Yes, Master, I couldn't take my eyes off her. I don't know what it was about her. And Master just casually said she died in a German concentration camp last, in her last life. And because of that life, she looks a little sad and older than her years. But because of the way she died, she has become a saint. And you were, you were drawn to her because of that underlay of suffering and yet that transcendence. It was She is a very... Um, Fascinating soul. But this is what you will find, that when people live a right way, there are no such things as obstacles. Conditions themselves are always neutral. That's hard to accept when you're in a place like a concentration camp or dungeon or when you're suffering from some terrible disease and you know that you're going to die soon. It doesn't seem uh, right. Sometimes it may seem as if God's being unfair to you. God is never unfair. He will always help you out. But you've got to help that help you've got to develop that that determination to accept whatever he sends you and accept it willingly and then he will be able to help you more. So it is when people like you Jason are doomed to die very soon. Okay, it's a reality, but if you can accept it with joy and realize that those whom you know and love, you will meet again. Death itself is not a final thing. You're completely conscious. In fact, much more conscious. In fact, this physical body is sort of a... Uh, creates great well, walls around us, walls of flesh. It's when you're released from this body that you can feel deeply. And the joys that you feel now become infinitely greater. And unfortunately, if you have not lived well, the evils that you have done and the sorrow you have created will be much greater for you too. 
But even that is temporary. All life is temporary until you realize him. Every experience is a temporary experience. But the one thing you must understand is that maya, delusion, is consistent in only one thing. It always breaks its promises. You think you'll find what you want in this? You don't. You think that you'll get away from what you didn't want? You won't. You think that everything will, if you try hard enough, you'll finally reach success. And you see these movies where the director carefully cuts the, the film before the, just as they get married, and they don't see, show you the rolling pins and black eyes afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to realize that everything that you do, good, bad, indifferent, there is no other end for it except zero. Everything has to cancel itself out because the nature of this world is duality. For every pleasure, there is an opposite pain. For every success, there's a failure. And most people, because they have what Master called the thwarting cross-currents of ego, they will pay for it much later. So in the first place, if they don't get the way they want, they say, God doesn't love me, God isn't for me. And if they get what they don't want, they say, God doesn't love me, God doesn't care for me. And if they, uh, all sorts of things. But in the end, it does come. And I, and those who are really have given their lives to God and don't have desires, then they find these things answered much more quickly because, Master, as Master said, these thwarting cross-currents of ego are no longer there to thwart you, to block you. I had this very interesting experience, and I've shared it with some of you, but it's worth talking about again. When I got a motorhome to go across the country, I just was absolutely delighted. I had long dreamed of getting, an, getting a motorhome where I could keep my own environment with me. Wherever I went, I could live in this motorhome and just teach and sing and share with people. And when we got this motorhome, I just sat back and laughed and laughed delightedly. And I knew in my mind, well, I've got to pay for this laughter. <laughs> I knew I would have to. I didn't mind. I just enjoyed it. <laughs> well, you know that very night, Vidura was in the motorhome. He was driving it, and he stopped. We stopped in a Safeway parking lot. And don't you feel badly for this, Vidura? <laughs> you were the agency of my karma. <laughs> But he went back to the refrigerator to get something, and he didn't see that he'd left the thing in gear. And there was no, no accelerator pressed down, but it was moving very gently <laughs> so that we couldn't feel it moving until, bam, it hit the side of the supermarket. <laughs> the supermarket wasn't hurt at all, but the, I was standing with my foot, one foot on the, on the floor, my knee on a bench, reaching up to get something from a uh, cupboard, and as soon as it hit, I was just thrown over, and I broke my finger. And I laughed and laughed just as, <laughs> just as hard as I had the first time, because I said that I knew that it would come. So anyway, that's over. <laughs> but remember that God is, you can't mock God. You can't, you can't win against his law. It will happen in strange ways, but the simplest karma will come back to you. And now, supposing it's your karma for a safe to fall on you and you've achieved liberation. Well, the safe will fall because that's a part of the karmic law. But if you're not there, it won't hit you. And so once you achieve the state of jivan mukta, there is no sense of identification with the ego. And so suddenly you find that these things don't hit you anymore. Or if they do, very little. If you're a devotee of God, and it's your karma to lose a leg. You will get something, but it may be only a scratch. So what you are doing, actually, in loving God and serving God, is that you're creating an aura, and we're ruled a lot more than we realize by this inner light, by, this, um, subtle, by these subtle truths. You will have that aura which will protect you. And if there's a weakness in that aura, then that can come in. But when you've got no ego, then your aura is shining and clear. 
And yes, the, the safe may drop on the ground, but you won't be there to get it. And if you are there, then it won't hurt you in the same way. You may just get a foot, foot hurt or something. A master like our guru, he takes the karma of other people. And his are not sufferings in the first place. He doesn't mind what happens to his body. He said when the wisdom dinner from the plate of life has been eaten, then you can break the plate, throw it away, keep it. It doesn't matter to you. And so when you have attained that, attained that wisdom, what happens to your body doesn't matter. But I remember one time he had been going through a great deal of trouble with his knees. He said this is an astral thing, not a physical thing. But he said, I can see those astral demons like corkscrews and others like saws working on my astral body. And he said that normally I don't think about it at all. But last night I wanted to feel the pain that other people feel so I could appreciate what they feel when they go through these things. And I could feel it in my body. But then I just... Um, one time he had a nurse then. And this nurse, I suppose, was a Christian who thought she was doing something terrible in helping this Hindu heathen. Anyway, she would treat him very badly, although his body was in bad shape, just sort of throw him around and push him. And finally he saw this blue light there, and he heard Divine Mother say, Give it to her. <laughs> <clears throat> he said, That was the test of God. He said, no, Divine Mother, no, you, take, you do whatever you like. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Well, these are stories I haven't told in my book. <laughs> but honestly, living with a master like him, my life has been dedicated to helping his mission to become known. This is why I'm alive. I, I could have died last May, but I felt that I said to him, I was feeling great bliss, and I said, Master, you can take me now if you want. I'm perfectly happy to leave. I'm not afraid. There's nothing I want, nothing I'm attached to. But if you want me to work here and stay and serve your work longer, I'm happy to stay also. It's all one to me. And suddenly I became cured. You know, last May in Lugano, I couldn't walk without a wheelchair. David uh, Praver and a few other men, four men it took to carry my wheelchair up the steps to Manor restaurant because I couldn't have begun to do it myself. And later I was able to walk with a cane, but even that was difficult. But I, when I left Assisi, I left my cane behind me. I knew I wouldn't need it again. And I don't need it. You saw me walk here. and um, I'm very well. And I don't even think of myself as having an age anymore. There's some strange thing that's happened to my consciousness. And I just don't feel I'm me. So this is a nice thought. Um, <laughs> I have to say I approve. <laughs> but the thing is that the more you can love God, the more you will find, why do you need a guru? Sometimes people come to me and say, do I need a guru? And if they say it belligerently, I say, no, of course you don't need a guru. But if you reach the point where you know that you want God, if you reach the point that you know that you're helpless without him, then you'll need a guru. A guru is, is uh, not an imposition. Shankaracharya said that a God-known guru is the greatest blessing one can have in the three worlds. And if you have gotten what I received from Master, that gift of unconditional love, that is no small thing. And it is such a great thing that I am very happy even to lay down my life to help all of you and help many, many other people to understand what life is all about. Life is not getting rich, having a good family, all those things that people tried to hold up to me when I was young. <clears throat> I thought I can't imagine a worse hell than that. It seemed like such a compromise. Some of them seemed fairly happy, but... What kind of a compromise was that when what I wanted was something I knew it was dif difficult, it was deeper. But you know, as I said earlier, when I came to this teaching, I didn't know the teaching existed. 
I didn't know the Indian teachings. I didn't know anything but what the church had taught me about Jesus Christ, which is, there's no such thing as Christianity today. It's, Chris, it's churchianity. What Jesus taught, he was a great rishi. He was teaching the same things Krishna taught. And in fact, in many ways, the, the Hindus are better Christians than the Christians are better Hindus. Because uh, the Hindus think in terms of uh, absolute renunciation, um, the Christians teach in terms of moderation. Krishna taught moderation. Jesus taught absolute renunciation. He said, don't think about tomorrow what you shall eat or what you shall put on. That's not exactly the thought of 99.9999% of Christians. <laughs> but the truth is that the that masters come into this world to teach what people need at that time. And renunciation, I'm trying... I, I keep getting interrupted, and I haven't been able to finish this book or even to get launched into it properly, but I'm, I want to start a new renunciate order in which householders as well as uh, brahmacharis can take part. I would like for people, the Slahiri Mahosh I started, for all of them to become swamis regardless of their outward position as long as inwardly they have that absolute dedication. And I have to say something more, and that is that I have met many swamis in India who do not satisfy me as being true swamis. And I would like an order of true swamis, people who are dedicated inwardly to the truth. There's one swami I met. Well, I won't tell you his name, but you know it. And uh, I was told that he wanted to see me and have me over for breakfast, so I went over and had breakfast. I was waiting for him to call me to breakfast, and um, he came in and said, they'll be bringing you a breakfast. So I thought, well, okay. Then he uh, I sa he said, uh, well, he wanted to show me what he'd been do doing in the world and helping humanity and so on. And uh, I said, well, really, I'd like to have a chance to talk with you. He said, go there and come back and then tell me what you have to say. Well, I didn't have something to say. I just wanted to feel his vibrations, wanted to uh, have communication with another person who was dedicated to God. And I went, and I came back after seeing these things, and he he said, you want some tea? I said, yes, I wouldn't mind if you want to give me tea. All right, go prepare tea up there. So they went and prepared tea. He didn't say a word. And uh, finally, he said, tea ready? Yes, yeah, so go up and have your tea. I thought, good <laughs> God. And you know, this man had uh, had uh, a desire for a certain plot of land to add to his work. And the people who had that land didn't want to sell it. And it wasn't long afterwards that a truck rode over them. The driver ran away. And you just wonder. They were killed, and so he got that land. I don't like this sort of thing. I don't suppose anybody here would like this kind of thing. I have seen some of these swamis in India cut corners ethically in order to accomplish their, what they consider, spiritual missions. Yata dharma stata jaya. Where there is devotion to truth, there is, there is victory. And I have been very rigidly adherent to that teaching so that many times I could have failed completely, and yet I refused to give in to those 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 temptations to cut short corners. I have refused. I will always refuse. I would rather lose everything that I have done in my life. And I have been tested in this way where it seemed as if that was what was at stake. But I have rigidly adhered to dharma, and I have believed that if I do the truth, God will take care of me. God will do what he wants, and if he doesn't want this work, I don't want it either. It's not for, um, for me that I'm doing it. I want what you want. And if in some way I've misunderstood him, let him have it. I'm not attached. But I have seen that I have always won out because I was always rigid in that adherence. You know when they were suing us? They. You know who? Most of you know who they are. <laughs> if you don't, I won't say. <laughs> because they cut many ethical corners. They, they tried by lies, they tried by subterfuge, they tried by 
many unscrupulous means to win. And I would even with that <clears throat> even with that possibility of their destroying everything, they had the third largest law firm in the world. I had a little sole practitioner who didn't even have a secretary. And was I stupid? Well, maybe. But I chose him because he was dharmic. I knew that he would only do that which is truthful, which is adhering to truth. And although he was, the odds against him were infinite to zero virtually, yet we won. And I have seen that that happens again and again. When you do what is right, all your friends even may be against you, but you will find in the end you will be right. God will support you. So keep that as your first principle in life. Yata dharma stata jaya. Where there is dharma, there is victory. And you will see that it will work. Sometimes you're not right as to what is right. So you must always, instead of being pig-headed, say, God, you show me what is right. But in this case, I felt, well, God, if you want to destroy me, that'll be your showing. But until then... This is what I have understood of your truth. I'm not being stubborn, but I will do my best, but I will let you decide. Let him decide. Action without desire for the fruit of the action. This is one of the greatest teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Act without desire for anything that you do. Do the right thing. And if you've made a mistake, God will correct you. In fact, what I was doing was a mistake in trying to build an organization. I didn't know it was a mistake. It was my guru's organization. I wanted to support it, but it was wrong for me. I had another work to do. He had told me he wanted me to reach people. He wanted me to spread these teachings to other people. I was interested in the people and what would help them. They were interested in what would help the organization. One of the things they said was that uh, in everything you do, have as your principle what will help the organization. Well, to me, that was not the highest principle. The highest principle is what will help the individual. And I would much, much rather lose everything during that lawsuit time when I was being threatened with everything. I wrote a book. It was called Do It Now. And I was so excited about this book, I thought, this is a great book, that I printed. I paid for the printing of 5,000 copies and gave them away free to people because it meant so much for me to me to have them. Yes, we needed that money desperately, but I just wanted to do this. And uh, I think I did the right thing. The money came back in one way or another. I remember one time I was on, I had been just thrown out of SRF. They left me with no more money than the money in my wallet. And I was down to $50. I didn't have any more than that. And uh, I picked up a hitchhiker. And he gave me this long sob story. And so I gave him half the money I had, $25, which for me was giving a lot. And he said, well, I'll be sure that you get this back. I don't want you to lose your faith in human nature. I said, listen, if I'd had faith in human nature, I'd have lost it years ago. <laughs> That's not my faith in human nature that makes me give you this. In fact, I did never give people a loan unless in my heart I feel I can give it away freely. And so when people don't give it back, which most of the time they don't, sometimes they do, but it just doesn't bother me. I've given it away anyway, so I don't care. Otherwise, what did Polonius say in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet? Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loseth both itself and friend. So this hitchhiker, he never paid me back, but it came back to me. There's a law beyond what you see with your own eyes. Most people worry, well, where is it coming from? I don't care. I have found that he always takes care of me. And even if I have very little, sometimes he takes care of me. I don't have to worry. So in understanding Master's teachings, the most important thing is not to think what's in it for me, but how can I serve God? He came, you know, he was. He said, and this is a book that Catherine Van Houten has written. It's a beautiful book. It's um, Two Souls, Four Lives. And uh, 
The two souls were William and Henry. Master often told us he was William the Conqueror. Well, as you know, I was raised in the English system, and I had always been taught that William the Conqueror was one of history's great villains. Here I found he was my own guru. You can imagine I had to do a lot of rethinking here. And uh, so I've studied his life at, uh, great, in great depth. And uh, Warren Hollister wrote the first book recently. It came, just a few years it came out. The first book of, William, of Henry, who was William's heir, spiritual heir. He's the one who completed William's mission. And almost all historians have, well, first of all, Henry's the least known king in England. Secondly, anything they do know about him, they turn against the poor guy. But I really have come very strongly to understand that I was Henry myself and that I was born then to help William with his mission, and I feel I have been born in this life to help Yogananda with his mission. And this book that Catherine has written, Two Souls, Four Lives, it really is a very interesting book. I know you'll like it. It'll be out in a couple of weeks in a pre-publication form and then the final publication with all the proper accrediting and bibliography and index and all those things will come out in February. But uh, this this uh, understanding of Master's work, then, I have read recently, A.E. Freeman, is it, or E.A. Freeman? One, uh, he's a famous historian. He said that everything we are today, we owe to William the Conqueror, an astonishing statement. But Newsweek, an American magazine, he was an Englishman writing, but an American magazine said the most influential people, person in the last thousand years has been William the Conqueror. That's an amazing statement. But when Master said, you don't have any idea what a great work this is, everybody else thought, well, they just took it for sort of, I don't know what, but they didn't understand that. They just assumed he'd come to do a little job, create a monastery, and that was it. But I knew he had a mission, and I used to meditate on what that mission meant. And this is why I've written all my books. Now I've written over a hundred books, and I've uh, tried to understand how his teachings can influence life in business, in marriage, in education, in everything man is involved in. Because this is a new age, and there are new ways of doing things. And what I've been saying here today is also a new way of doing things. Do it with faith, doing it with understanding that there's a flow involved. And I've seen that this flow is there. You know, I wanted to go to Mexico. I had $115, which I had got also by, um, you might call sure luck, but it was by affirmation. And I wanted to go to Mexico, and I didn't have any idea how to get there. I was hitchhiking, and I had a ticket between New York and Philadelphia. So I took the ticket on the plane, on the train, and uh, this couple behind me, I was carrying a knapsack, and they thought, oh, are you a um, hiker or uh, whatever they called it? And uh, no, I wasn't, therefore I don't know what they called it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we got to talking, and we began singing songs together and folk songs and so on. And they invited me to their home in Ardmore, and it was a palatial mansion. And uh, at the next day, the dowager of the clan, it was a, a, they were having a marriage that weekend, and so people were coming from all over the country to be there, and it was big festivity all the way. And then this dowager said, you know, I have a son-in-law who's leaving for Mexico. Day, uh, he's leaving tomorrow, and he'd love to have a driver. So the, I w got to go to Mexico with no money at all. He paid for my travels and l signed me on as a, as a alternate driver, and I stayed in his home in Mexico, and I made my $115 last the whole summer, and it was just fine. But I've seen again and again that God does take care of you, and it's not necessarily even thinking God. That makes it much better when you do. But there is a flow in consciousness. If you have faith in what you're doing, and we're in a new age when that enters in more easily, that faith will bring you the fulfillment of your desires. And I've seen that happen so many times, it doesn't, isn't even worth the trouble trying to recall them all. But if there's one thing I can help you to understand is that 
Master's way of doing things, it may seem unrealistic from a Kali Yuga point of view, but it does work. And in any way that you are serving God, humanity, whatever it be, do it as a service. Do it from the right, with the right spirit, with the right attitude. Do it thinking what you can do for other people. And do it in that flow. What I have done in starting Ananda and in writing all these books, I feel it's just a tiny little beginning of the river. It's sort of starting the spring. But what it will result in in the future is very great. One time when Master was early, in his early years at, in Boston, he would start telling Dr. Lewis all the things that this work would have, and Dr. Lewis would see him living in this little one-room flat, one-room bedroom in a rooming house in Boston. And he'd say, when, when? Master said, you'll see. Well, doctor could never have believed it, it became great. And I say this now, when, when, you may ask. It will happen. And this work that Master has brought is just the greatest thing that has been brought into this world. It has been brought to change the world. And you're on to a good thing here. <laughs> you're on to something that will really help all humanity. People worry about saving the trees. There's no harm in saving trees. In fact, it's a good thing to do. Lots of things are good things to do, but the thing that he brought is central. And this is what will really change the world. This teaching is going to bring about a change that will change all of human consciousness. We are the beginning trickle of a very great flood, and it is our joy and our privilege to be a part of it. And as I celebrate my 61st anniversary here, I think of these things, and I think how much good we can accomplish. My 61 years, I haven't done anything really, but a few good things have happened, yes, sure. But they're very small compared to what they will be in the long run. In the long run, your lives are going to be a great blessing for all of humanity. And the more you put your shoulder to the wheel, the more you help these things to happen, the more you will see that, uh, you know, we're fighting a war between light and darkness in this age. And the darkness is very strong. But the light is strong too. And there's a slowly growing love for God and desire for God. And even during these hard financial times, more and more people are coming to these teachings. You will see that if you fight for the light, if you fight on the side of goodness, you will be on the side of the angels and your life will be blessed. Joy to you.